Okay, so welcome to What's New in Sudo 1.9. I'm Todd Miller. This is Peter Sonic. Uh, we're both from One Identity, um, which is a company that does um, identity access management. And um, I'm a Sudo maintainer, and, and One Identity is nice enough to, uh, to pay for me to maintain Sudo as part of my job. And that's very nice. <laughs> so without further ado, What's New in Sudo 1.9? So what we're going to talk about today is just first what is sudo and then go over some of the sudo 1.8 features that are already present and then jump into the new things in 1.9. So what is sudo? So it kind of depends on who you are, what your environment's like. Um, it can be either something that gets in your way because you just want to run a, a root command. Um, you can think of it as just a prefix for running administrative commands. It's what you're used to doing. And it can also be a way to see who ran what, which is great when you are in a, a large environment. You come in, on, <coughs> excuse me, come in on a Monday, and say, "Okay, now w why is this broken? What happened over the weekend, or what happened Friday?" So, kind of depends on whether it's a single user system or um, a multi-user kind of an enterprise environment. So, sudo allows the system to give users the ability to run privileged commands, um, either as root or as some other user without using a uh, root shell or the su command. And each command gets logged, and optionally, starting um, a little before 1.8, you can log the terminal output as well as the user input. So basically record the whole session for a later playback. Uh, commands are run by we're using the sudo prefix, so sudo whatever, sudo id, sudo vi, et cetera. And the policy configuration is stored in a file called the suitors file. <coughs> So a little history. So sudo actually has a really long history, longer than probably most people remember. Um, the first version was in 1980, came out of SUNY Buffalo. In 1985, there was a version posted to the net.sources Usenet group that was before the great renaming. Some, some people might remember that here, I don't know. Yes, oh, good. I don't feel quite so old now, thank you. <clears throat> so 1986, um, a bunch of the people from SUNY Buffalo came to University of Colorado Boulder and uh, there was a, a CU version of sudo, and that version got maintained and, and updated over the years. And that was the version that um, was described in the first edition of the Unix System Administrator's Handbook that Evie Nemeth and others wrote. And so that, so that book really uh, had a big uh, part in, in popularizing sudo and getting it to a wider audience. In 1991, there was a version written by um, a group of system, two sysadmins and, also, and people at uh, CU who also worked for a consultancy group called the Root Group, and they wrote a new version of sudo that was kind of network aware that you could have um, multiple, you could have per, per, um, per host bits of it. So you could have a, a distributed sudo as file instead of just everything being uh, different on each local machine. And that was helpful because we, we had a sort of a heterogeneous network there with different, uh, different Unix vendors and different things. And at the time we were distributing files via Ardist. So that was a while ago. So 1994, um, those people had left. I started maintaining sudo um, sort of unofficially. And then in 1994, I made my first actual release to the rest of the world um, after getting in. And that was great because I got feedback. I got patches from people. Um, someone rewrote the parser, which was nice. Um, so that was a, a useful thing. And then in 2003, someone uh, donated support for LDAP sudo, so storing the sudoers information in an LDAP directory. Um, and that still gets used today. So then jumping ahead a bit to 2010, that was when the keystroke logging was first introduced. That was still sudo 1.7. And 2011 um, added plugin support. So support for adding your own uh, policy or IO plugins. And that was announced at scale 9x nine years ago today, or well, not today, but <laughs> roughly today. <coughs> And then so today we have sudo 1.9, um, which introduces Python plugins, a recording server, and a couple of other new plugins. Um, so that's, that's what's going on there. So I'm going to hand it over to Peter Sonic now. He's going to talk a little bit about the uh, sudo 1.8 current state of things. Uh, 
when you install uh, sudo, uh, you will get a different, uh, the, the default configuration uh, installed to, together with it. And it's really very simple. Uh, usually just a uh, single rule allowing uh, the uh, m members of the wheel group to do everything on your system. The columns here mean that uh, who, uh, who can do uh, stuff where uh, a switch user and which comments are allowed. Any of these uh, fields uh, can be replaced by a list, a list of users, a list of uh, hosts, and so on. Uh, but even this really very simple configuration is better than using the root, di uh, root user directly, as uh, this way uh, you can see from the log logs who did what. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, it's not just you and your best friend uh, maintaining your system, you uh, will st start to fine tune uh, the sudoers file. And uh, mm, instead of allowing everything, you will uh, make sure that only a small subset of comments uh, are allowed. Uh, that's uh, when you uh, start to uh, use uh, lists, a list of administrators who can do what and uh, or a list of comments and it's uh, after a while you will see that you will copy and paste uh, these lists around, uh, around in your configuration file making it quite difficult to maintain uh, if you uh, forget to delete one of your admins and just in one place uh, that can be trouble this is where aliases can come handy uh, which can simplify uh, your configuration and make it a lot less error prone uh, here are a couple of examples, uh, a host alias with uh, a number of web servers, a user alias with a number of uh, administrators, and a command alias uh, with uh, a couple of commands which can reboot your uh, system. And at the bottom of the screen you can see how to use this. Uh, sudo comes with a huge set of uh, default settings, uh, which uh, are uh, quite sane. On the other hand, uh, in, in some cases you might want to override them. Th this is when uh, the default mm, mm, keyword comes handy. You can, uh, you know, on the screen, you can see a couple of examples like overriding the path which uh, sudo uh, considers secure, uh, which uh, environment variables to keep from the users, and uh, disabling ins insults for everyone. Uh, th these previous settings are uh, valid gl globally, but you can also uh, change uh, defaults uh, specific uh, to a group of users or hosts. In this case, uh, we enable uh, insults for uh, the members of the wheel group. So what are insults? Uh, these are some funny uh, error messages uh, printed on screen when you mistype your password. Uh, in sudo. Uh, they are fun for most users, but not always politically correct, uh, which means that uh, it's after a while they got disabled by default, uh, but you can easily enable them uh, in your configuration. Uh, Digest, verifi digest verification is quite a new feature. It, uh, in, in this case, you can store uh, uh, the hash of applications in uh, the sudoers file, and they are checked uh, before running the application, which means that uh, sudo can prevent uh, modified binaries from running. Uh, the database itself can be quite uh, difficult to maintain. On the other hand, if you don't trust much your users, it can provide you with an additional layer of protection. Uh, when uh, you enable session recording, anything happening on your terminal can be uh, recorded to a file and also played back, uh, just like a, a video recording. Uh, this is especially useful if you, have, if you need to hand out shell access to your users, uh, but uh, in other cases uh, as well. Uh, these log messages are uh, difficult to modify as they are not clear text. On the other hand, uh, they, they are easy to be deleted uh, as they, uh, they are saved locally. And if you hand out shell access, then uh, deleting is quite easy. But stay tuned. Uh, 
Sudo 1.8 introduced a plugin-based architecture, which uh, means that even basic functions of Sudo are implemented as plugins. Uh, this way, uh, you can replace or extend functionality of Sudo uh, using plugins. There are both uh, open source and uh, commercial plugins available for Sudo. Here, I want you. I, I want to show you uh, Sudo pair. Uh, which is an open source plugin for sudo. Using this, uh, you can make sure that an administrator cannot do anything on uh, their own, uh, but uh, needs another administrator to approve uh, comments before uh, running. And the other administrator can also follow on screen what is happening, and if there is something suspicious, uh, then uh, they can terminate the session as well. The drawback is of this plugin is uh, that it's developed in Rust, which means that it can be difficult to compile and even more difficult to distribute the results. Uh, but let me show you how it works. Uh, on the right hand side, I'm logged in as a regular user. On the left hand side, I'm logged in as root. So I will run sudo on the right hand side and approve the session on the left hand side. Uh, it asks for a password uh, and then prints two numbers, the process ID and the user ID. Uh, and here first, oh, I wanted to reject it, but anyway. Uh, here I proved it accidentally, but uh, no problem. Uh, Let's, I, I do something on the right hand side, like listing a directory or another one. And as you can see, anything I do on the right hand side is mirrored uh, on the left hand side where I did the approval. Now let's try something nasty on the right hand side. Rm minus fr, if you cannot read it from the back. Uh, but on the, the administrator on the left hand side luckily uh, follows the, uh, what is happening and quickly terminates the session using control D. So when the administrator on the right hand side tries to uh, execute the command and hits enter, nothing happens. The session is terminated. Uh, Let's talk a bit about configuring sudo. Uh, we already mentioned that it's stored in etc sudoers, and it's a text file, but you shouldn't add it directly, but use vi sudo uh, as it also does uh, syntax checking for, uh, for the configuration file. If you don't like vi, uh, you can change it to the editor of your text editor of your choice. Uh, just uh, make sure that when you are experimenting with uh, ed sudo, uh, you know the root password. Yes, even on Ubuntu. As, uh, having a syntactically correct uh, configuration file doesn't mean that you can do anything uh, through sudo. As, uh, an empty file is also completely valid. Uh, the configuration file is uh, in, uh, read by sudo from the top to the bottom, uh, which means that the last setting wins. Uh, it means that you should start with some generic settings and uh, add uh, exceptions uh, at the end. Otherwise, uh, it will be over then. Here is an example configuration. This one is uh, from uh, CentOS, and I added a few additional settings at the end. As you can see, mm, there are a huge uh, set of defaults at the beginning. Then the usual root and wheel group uh, can do everything. Then uh, I enable insults for the wheel group, but en uh, disable insults for everyone else. And uh, on the final uh, line, uh, log output means that uh, I enable uh, session recording. So, could you catch a problem in, on the previous slide? There is a very common mistake. Yes, that's it. 
as uh, with this setting, uh, it sets, uh, it, it enables insults uh, for the wheel group, but the last setting wins, and this, this means that uh, insults is disabled for everyone on the system. So you, you should reverse the order, and it works. Uh, once you have more than one system to uh, maintain, uh, you will most likely enable some kind of central management uh, for your configuration. Puppet, Ansible, uh, Chef, uh, Sort, every, every, uh, all of them uh, has some support for uh, sudo. Uh, the drawback is that uh, when you change uh, a setting uh, in one of these, uh, configuration is not updated in real time. Also, uh, there is a window uh, time, time frame when users can modify uh, settings also locally. And, norma uh, and in most cases, uh, config configuration management systems don't really know uh, the exact features uh, on the uh, um, host, like uh, um, if um, digest, digest checking is already available on the given uh, version or not, so it might uh, give out, uh, some errors. An uh, another possibility for cent uh, central management is storing configuration in LDAP. It has the advantage that as soon as you uh, make a change, uh, it pro propagates in real time. Uh, also, you cannot change uh, configuration locally uh, at all. On the other hand, there are quite a few limitations, like uh, you cannot use aliases in LDAP, and also uh, if your LDAP ser server is unreachable, then you cannot use sudo at all. Uh, an often overlooked feature of uh, sudo is logging and alerting. Uh, sudo itself supports uh, email-based alerting uh, for specified uh, events. And it also sends all events to syslog. Just make sure that your uh, syslog events are uh, uh, centralized, otherwise they are easy, easily deleted uh, by users. If you are using syslogng to collect your uh, sudo uh, log messages, then uh, syslogng parses uh, sudo messages automatically, and you can uh, uh, send uh, alerts not just to uh, email, but also to Slack, uh, Splunk, Elasticsearch, uh, Telegram, wherever you want. If you are lucky, then you don't need to enable debug locks uh, on your systems at all. Uh, deb uh, debug uh, messages can be used to debug rules if uh, they don't work as ex expected or when you want to uh, report a problem with sudo. Uh, as you can see, I'm in a syslogng t-shirt, I'm from the syslogng team, so uh, I will uh, show you quickly how to create an alert in syslogng for sudo and send it to Slack. Uh, so what is syslogng? Uh, if you don't know, it's an enhanced logged-in daemon with a strong focus on portability and high-performance central log collection. Uh, when it comes to configuring uh, syslogng, my initial advice is always don't panic. Uh, it's simple and logical but it doesn't really look uh, so at first sight and often not even at the second sight. Uh, it has a pipeline model, uh, which has many different building blocks like sources, destinations, or filters, and so on. And uh, these building blocks are connected together into a pipeline using log statements. Uh, let me show you a uh, very typical configuration. What is on screen is uh, similar what mo most systems have, have for var log messages. So uh, the configuration it starts, uh, itself starts with a uh, version number. You can include uh, other configurations as well, comment your config, have some global options so you don't have to set uh, a, a buff buffer size uh, each time. Uh, and then here we have a couple of building blocks, a source, a destination, and a filter. Uh, and the heart of the configuration is in the, at the bottom of the screen in the log statement, which connects all of these building blocks together, the source, the filter, and the destination. Let's go on to uh, mm, 
in configuring uh, sudo alerts within SyscoNG. First, we define a filter here uh, to uh, filter um, on uh, sudo events. The next one is not, the next destination is not strictly necessary, but it's good for debugging and creating your configuration. It's a file destination in JSON format. Uh, so you have all of the name value pairs uh, included uh, and you can check uh, what, what uh, Cisco Genji parses from uh, sudo logs. And uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see a very minim minimalistic uh, uh, Slack destination, uh, it's just a URL where you send uh, log messages. Uh, there is no parser defined here in this configuration as uh, parsing sudo log messages uh, is done automatically by syslogng. Uh, here is a log statement which connects all of the previous uh, mm, building blocks together and also that does some uh, extra stuff. A source, uh, the very same as we used uh, for the warlock messages file, a filter for uh, sudo messages and uh, here we have an extra filter which is matching on my username if it appears in a specific field uh, of the parsed log messages. Uh, and if there is a match then uh, the log messages uh, are sent to Slack. You can see here the re results. Uh, all of the messages are uh, coming from uh, my username, uh, Tsonic. I'm ha handing it back to Todd. Okay, great. <clears throat> so now to the 1.9 bits. So the major changes in 1.9 are recording service uh, to collect the IO logs centrally. Those are previously the uh, session logs were all stored locally because there wasn't a great way to distribute those. And there are two additional uh, plugin types, an audit plugin for custom logging and an approval plugin which adds sort of additional constraints on the, uh, the policy. And then Python support for all the different plugins, which probably makes some people happy. <clears throat> so okay, first the recording service. Um, the main idea here is to collect those IO logs in a central location. Um, that's done by the, the sudo log serve daemon and the, uh, the sudoers IO log plugin now has support, client support for talking to that. So the logs are streamed real time, um, so in theory you could um, view them real time on the, on the server. And the protocol is built on top of the Google protocols buffer library. And connections are secured with TLS, either 1.2 or 1.3, depending on what version of uh, OpenSSL you have. And on the on log server, you can use sudo replay just like you would normally. Um, it works pretty much the same as it would on the local machine, and the log files are stored in the same format on the remote server. So the obvious question here is why not use syslog? Um, the problem with syslog is that traditionally it hasn't always been reliable. It's usually used uh, UDP to transmit uh, things, and of course UDP is the unre unreliable datagram protocol. Now, modern syslog daemons do use TCP, or can use TCP anyway, um, but the problem with that is you don't necessarily know how big a buffer the syslog daemon can actually handle. Um, tra the traditional BSD syslog D had about a 1K buffer for its uh, messages, and there wasn't any way to tell whether you'd really overflowed that or not. Um, so the, the message size varying makes things difficult. And also, replaying these files, if they're just stored in text files, becomes a hard thing too, because all of a sudden you've got to parse all of the, the text, convert it into binary data, and then what happens if things are out of order, or if you have a session that spans multiple log files, like if the log gets rotated or something like that. So it just seemed like it was too complicated to do it uh, via syslog, and that's why I ended up doing a, a custom log daemon. So, but then the question is, what happens if that remote server is unavailable? Um, so by default, uh, we fail closed, and so the command can't be, ru can't be run if it can't contact the, the server. But you can support, you can have multiple servers listed in pseudovers. Um, so, and you can determine whether or not that failure is, the fail is uh, fatal or whether it's just ignored. 
And by default, it's still logging locally. So this is all optional settings here. Um, still on my to-do list for the log server is the ability to redirect uh, a client to another server, sort of a simple load balancing, and also to transmit logs um, for when the log server was un unavailable to send them back uh, when it comes back. And it does, sudo does come with uh, a little utility program called sudo send log that can send existing logs to a log, to log server. It's just that the um, there's no automatic support for, for sending those to a log server that was down for a little bit. Okay, so now for the new plugin types, the audit plugin. So basically an API to access Sudo's logging events and uh, pass them to a plugin. So you have four events. You have an accept, reject, error, and exit. And required a minor change to the existing policy and IO plugins to actually save uh, an error message previously. Uh, the plugins just returned a minus one when there was an error and then sudo would exit and hope that the plugin displayed an error message to the user. So now we have an actual way to report back what the problem was and the audit plugins can use that. They can consume that and, and log that in some way. Multiple audit plugins are supported um, and there's an example plugin that comes with sudo 1.9 that outputs JSON. Now this has not replaced the the existing sudo is logging. Um, at some, some point in the future it might, but right now this is something that's in addition to and not replacing um, existing stuff. So one interesting thing about the audit plugin is that it gets a lot more details than the default sudo logs have. So the default sudo logs that go to syslog pretty much just have the host, the user that ran the command, the command itself, what user it ran as, the terminal, and their current working directory, and that's about it. But the audit plugin actually has the full details of, of both the invoking user and how the command's going to be run because it has all the information that sudo uses to actually create that execution environment. So the UID, the, all the groups, the environment, things like that, as well as the information about the user that ran it, um, things like the, the user's original environment, uh, the process ID, the parent process ID, session ID, things like that. So whether you find that it interesting or not, it, it is available to the audit plugin. Um, so this could be useful from the Python plugins because you can do your own custom logging to various cloud services thing, or things like Elasticsearch, all without using external tools. We just talked about how you could do that with Syslog NG, but with uh, an audit plugin, you could do it natively and uh, not require an external tool. So the API itself is very simple. Um, there's an open call that gets called before any other plugin because it has to be able to receive an error message from anything. Uh, there's a close call that happens right after, right before sudo exits after the command is done, and that gets the command's exit status or its signal number if it got killed. There's a show version function because all the plugins have this uh, just as a way to display the version to the user. And the real meat of it is the accept, reject, and error functions. So. As you might imagine, accept and reject get called after the policy runs and, and provides an answer, whether the command's allowed or not. And also after the approval plugin, if there's one of those, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the functions all receive the plugin name and the plugin type, so they can log what, what caused the acceptance or rejection or the error. And also the command info, so what commands w were being run, and the, the environment. Um, although the environment's only available for the accept plugin because for reject, um, it wouldn't have created the environment to run, run the command in. And then the error function is only called if the plugin or sudo itself reports an error. And that also gets the plugin name and the plugin type and that error string that I talked about earlier. So now the approval plugin, what we found, or I found, I guess, is that people really, um, even though they could replace the policy plugin, they could replace sudoers with something else, they didn't really want to do that. Um, people just wanted the ability to kind of add some extra uh, restrictions on there, some extra constraints. And so that's where the approval plugin comes from. And it's only called if the policy plugin succeeds. So we can add some extra policy without actually replacing suitors. And multiple po approval plugins are supported, but they all must succeed for the command to run. And this gives us a much simpler API than the policy plugin. It's really just yes or no, am I allowed or am I not? 
but it can still interact with the user like the policy plugin does, like Suitors does. So there are a couple of possible uses, uses here. Um, maybe you could do time of day restrictions. Certain users perhaps could only run commands during normal business hours or something like that. Um, more interesting is probably just-in-time authorization. We're kind of moving into a world where things are done just in time. And you can conceive of a, a permissive suitors policy that allows uh, certain users to run anything as long as they get approval. And the, the, that the approval could take different forms. Maybe it's some, a message that pops up on some kind of instant messenger or a phone app and they have to push to allow this person to run this command as root. Um, another possible use is multi-factor authentication. Um, Sudo uses PAM and you could do multi-factor authentication with PAM, but uh, people have been asking for other ways to do multi-factor uh, multi authentication that's uh, more granular than just within the PAM configuration. So maybe based on the user, you could do different authentication types. <coughs> so those are some of the possibilities. But uh, right now I just have a, a very simple time of day uh, example plugin. But, so I'm, I'm ex hoping that other people will, will uh, implement things that meet their own needs. So this is also a pretty simple API here. We have an open function that gets the original user info, kind of similar to the audit plugin, as well as the, the command, all the RV from sudo itself, the, the initial environment. Then the check function is what actually gives the yes or no answer. And that's passed the command to run, as well as the full execution environment. And the close function doesn't really do much other than let you do cleanup. And then again, show version, as I said before, just prevent, just pro, uh, prints a version message. So the other big thing um, is Python support for plugins. So previously you had to, if you wanted to extend sudo with a plugin, you had to write that in C, which is great if you like C, and, and I do. Um, <laughs> But, but lots of people are, are fans of Python these days, and it certainly is, is easier than writing something in C and probably um, in some ways more portable if you're trying to distribute uh, your own custom plugins to a variety of different machines. But the API is it's very similar to the C API, just a little more Python-y, a little more object-oriented. Um, it's documented on the URL there, but um, it's very similar to the existing uh, sudo plugin documentations, we have now a, a Python version of that. So a nice thing about this is you don't have to have a full de C development environment if you want to do uh, your Python plugins. Pretty much everything is uh, already linked into the Python plugin shared object that's got a Python interpreter there. And so all you really need is the ability to, to write a Python script and you're good to go. And sudo 1.9 comes with several Python plugin examples that you can look at and modify. So I'm going to hand it back to Peter here for an example of Iolog's yeah. Python. Uh, this is a very simple de demo. Uh, here on the left-hand side, you can see a, a short Python script. Uh, it just imports this pseudo module, uh, defi uh, defines a new class based on uh, sudo.plugin. And uh, mm, and uh, the log TTY DT, out is uh, called each time uh, by sudo when uh, uh, new uh, information appears on screen. I, in this case, uh, all uh, all we do is checking if uh, my secret appears uh, on screen, and if it appears there, then. Uh, sudo, uh, the Python script within sudo uh, terminates the session. Uh, I have here a directory called do not enter, and if we list it, we see that my secret, just uh, the very same string as uh, in the Python script, is uh, here, is, it's here as a file name. So let's try to run sudo on the right hand side terminal. I change to the root directory. Uh, oh, there is a do not enter directory. It's, it must be very interesting. So let's enter it and list it. But I have no luck. My session was terminated before uh, any information could appear on screen. <clears throat> All right, let's see. 
So, so in conclusion, I guess, uh, so sudo is more than a prefix. You've got a bunch of things both in 1.8. Oh, just a reminder. So I don't forget the stickers, yes. <laughs> so we have fine-grained permissions, um, things like aliases, defaults, the, the New York Digest verification, session recording, logging, alerting, uh, LDAP support, and then plugins. And then now in 1.9, we have Python plugins, the audit API, the approval API, as well as the centralized uh, session recording. So the ability to, to keep those logs in one place and hopefully keep them safe from modification. So what's next? So for future directions, I'd like to finish some of the more um, advanced things with the log server that I hadn't done yet, like load balancing, uh, automatic forwarding when an offline server returns. Um, other things people have asked for over the years are better sudo shell integration. So there are times when you do need to run a root shell with sudo, but that means once you do that, uh, you lose all your logging. So you want at least to have the ability to log those commands that are run and, and apply some policy to them as well. Even though you're in a root shell, we can still call out to sudo and, uh, and make a policy decision or log. Uh, sudo replay improvements right now. Um, sudo replay lets you re look, look at the, the uh, session, speed it up, slow it down, pause, things like that. But it doesn't really let you fast forward or rewind and things like that. Um, and that kind of thing, it'd be nice to treat it more like a DVR and, and have that kind of ability. It's a little, a little tricky because basically we're just kind of uh, catting, effectively we're catting the output of a, a TTY to a new TTY. Um, so there's not a whole lot of information about uh, what things look like on the screen that you know programmatically. But you can still uh, do some of the rewind and, and fast forward things pretty well, I think. Another thing people have asked for is a reporting utility of some kind, the ability to say, to ask the you know, program, what, what commands can this user run, produce some sort of reports on uh, who's allowed to run what, things like that. And we have some functionality here with sudo minus L to do that, but it's, it's not really uh, a good way to report on a large number of people. And the final thing I'd like to, to work on in the near future is privilege separation. Right now, most of sudo runs is root, and um, that inc includes things like user interactions, uh, network I.O., things that don't actually require root access. I'd like to, to keep that separate and have um, an unprivileged process do those kinds of interactions and then keep the privileged operations in a much smaller uh, program, basically. So that's kind of what I'm thinking for the future. So, um, sudo 1.9 is in beta right now. Um, the source is available both on GitHub and on the sudo website. There are binary packages, even though there's a beta, it's a beta version, or you can download the source and build it yourself. So, without any further ado, how about some questions? Yes? Python, two or three? Three. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the, what is this Python 2 you speak of. <laughs> Uh, I will. I don't at the, at the moment, but they will be on the sudo website, and I think the, they'll be on the scale website too. Yes. It's basically an and. So the question is, with with the SHA digests. Um, does it have to match, or is it? So you're you're asking whether it has to be the the, the the digest has to match the command, and it can't. It's not just allow any command with this digest. Can you allow uh, specify multiple digests for a single command? Ah, um, hmm. You could. You just ha would have to list them separately. So you would you would say digest command comma digest same command. Oh, actually, ooh, no, actually, would that work? Uh, I, th I think, yeah, yeah, no, that's not gonna work, I'm sorry. Yeah, last match is gonna win. So no, yeah, I guess you're right, yeah, it's, it's, that's gonna be, uh, the only the last one's gonna be valid. I hadn't thought about that. That would be a, a good feature to have. Yes?
You can still do groups. So, so the, you just don't have command aliases or user aliases like you do in the suitors file. Um, I mean, the way, just because of the way you do an LDAP lookup, right? It's a, it's a query, so you kind of have to need, you need to know all those pieces of, of info that you're querying. Um, and the way sudo builds that up is it's, if it's, if this user matches or one of their groups matches, so it can do, you can do groups and you can do net groups. Well, you would have to do multi, I think you'd have to do multiple queries to do that. So, so the way it works right now is that sudo gets the user's group list um, from the kernel and resolves those into names and then builds a query based on that. Okay, in the back there, yes. Um, well, it depends whether, I guess, hmm. if you don't have a, a, a root user, then not really. I mean, you can do things like, what, why I, what I often do is I use like a, a pipeline and I'll like tar, you know, tar cf dash whatever, pipe to ssh some other command, sudo tar xf dash, a little <laughs> clunky. <laughs> um, but there's not a, a really good way to do like a secure file transfer with sudo without having like a, a root account. Okay, yes? Who's responsible for spelling the command alias cmnd instead of cmnd like on that, that was not me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was that way when I got there. Um, yeah, I, I messed that up too. Maybe I, I could make it work either way. <laughs> Okay, yes? Uh, so, uh, what's the over under um, one identity uh, pulling a syslog ng on the user? So, what do you mean by that? Uh, so, uh, they, they, they sort of commercialized uh, parts of syslog ng. Um, and uh, I was just curious. Like, All right, okay. So, yeah, I guess, I guess syslog ng has like a community version and then an enterprise version or something like that. Um, so, so one identity does have a product that that uses sudo, but it, it's all the, all of the one identity sudo related things are are adding on to sudo, adding on to the the open source version of sudo. So there's no, I don't think there's any plans to have like a, two separate versions of sudo in that way. Anyone else? Yes. Gosh, um, well, you, you said that, that, that SUSE did a good job, right? Yes, uh, I'm pretty sure they are doing a good job at it, but at least in, in the uh, rolling release, uh, I'm not really sure about the others. I think Debian does a good job too. I mean, the, the problem is that any of the long-term support uh, Linux distros, they, they tend to, to sort of freeze a certain pseudo version and then just backport patches. And I can understand why, you know, they want to have as few changes as possible, but it does mean that, that they may have the same version of sudo for almost 10 years, which is a long, long time, or whatever their long-term support is. Maybe it's not quite that long, but it seems that long. <laughs> Looks like that's